Welcome back. During our next session, we will hear from Dr. Chad Morris, who will present Implementing Tobacco Treatment Programs in Behavioral Health and Mental Health Settings. Dr. Chad Morris is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. There, he serves as the director of the Behavioral Health and Wellness Program and as co-director of the Inter Interdisciplinary Wellness Leadership Institute. He has served as principal investigator on over 100 grants and contracts to study and implement effective organizational, psychosocial, and pharmacologic wellness strategies across the age range. He has provided clinical, public policy, and program evaluation consultation across more than 35 states and internationally. He is a member of MINT, which stands for Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers, and he served on a number of boards, including the American Psychological Association's Council of Representatives, the National Association for the Treatment of Tobacco Use and Dependence, and the North American Quitline Consortium, just to name a few. Something we wanted to share with you is that Dr. Morris and Dr. Coley had the good fortune of working together with Eastern State Hospital using Dr. Morris's Build a Clinic program that supports development of tobacco treatment clinics within behavioral health care environments. Welcome, Dr. Morris. Well, thank you all. Thanks for letting me uh, join your, your meeting today. Um, and thanks very much uh, for the invitation, uh, particularly from my, my uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Ecoli. Um, it's a, a pleasure pleasure to be here and, and, and speak on this topic, uh, which I, you know, I really hold, hold close to my, my heart. And uh, it, so, you know, I'd, I'd like to start uh, today by just you know, talking about a few words in, in this title, I was, I was kind of pondering this, um, you know, a few minutes ago about what I wanted to you know, share with you initially. Um, and I was looking at the title and, and, and one of this uh, presentation and one, one uh, word I'd like to really key in on is uh, recovery. And so, you know, that that's really where I started. Uh, my career is looking at recovery models in behavioral health, and that was very, you know, long before I ever thought I would get involved in anything to do with uh, nicotine addiction or, or tobacco use. But I, you know, I was very, very um, involved with and interested in people's per personal jur journeys towards health, particularly in the behavioral health world. And it was really clear that, you know, when I was looking at recovery, that didn't mean that you're going to be symptom free or that didn't mean that you didn't have to deal with the pressures or, or stressors of, of everyday life. But it was really um, this idea coming from the grassroots, the individuals I was working with, that it was the freedom to really maximize uh, one's uh, potential and to function at one's highest capacity and really to do that in the most integrated um, integrated environments possible so you know really moving out of hospital settings other institutional care settings um, and it was being able to live beyond stigma and implicit bias and it was having hope and it was being empowered and it was being uh, resilient in the in the face of adversity, but at the same time, it was really clear that you know to have that it was one thing to take that on as a human being, but we needed a support to do that. The people that I was working with, you know, all of us need support institutionally from our communities, from our health agencies that we work with. Uh, so, how does this tie into nicotine and tobacco use when I? talk about recovery and why I got involved in this work to begin with. And it was really because I heard that nicotine use was impinging on people's recovery and their personal journeys towards being the highest, uh, highest version of themselves. And this really was, you know, at the same time, I was hearing individuals say that they wanted to quit tobacco, they wanted to quit their nicotine use, and they were not being afforded the same opportunities as, as the general uh, population. Um, and so, you know, that becomes a social justice issue when individuals aren't afforded the same opportunities as the general population and um, it's getting in the way of their recovery. 
And so that's why this took on such importance to me and why this is such a piece of individuals, um, you know, personal journeys and why it's so important, the work that you're all doing. You all are doing incredible uh, work out there. I, you know, I've been following it for quite some time. And so I know that um, some of what I'm going to say today, you're very familiar with, and I hope I can add to that just a little bit. Um, the other word I want to key in on here is the word hidden uh, in this title. So tackling the hidden epidemic of tobacco use. You know, I've been doing this for uh, this work for about 20 years now, something like that, a little over 20 years. I don't know that it's hidden anymore. I don't know that it was ever hidden necessarily, but it wasn't a priority. And um, it, due to competing demands, due to new issues that arise, the pandemic, the opioid crisis, the, you know, the suicide epidemic, it gets obscured. So I don't know that it's hidden, but we need to, part of our work, part of what we're doing is keeping this on the radar as uh, the thing that's killing the most uh, individuals in the behavioral health world and in the general population and across the world. And so, you know, that, you know, in reflecting on this title, um, th those are some of the things that really stood out to me. And so the question is, well, what do we do with that? Have we been really uh, moving the needle? Have we not been moving the needle in this regard? I said that I've been doing this work for uh, a few decades. And so, you know, some days, you know, sometimes I say, you know, the, the days can seem uh, really long and the weeks can seem short. And sometimes it's really easy to lose track of whether we're making a difference or not in this regard. Um, and, uh, you know, I will tell you that I've, uh, it's very clear to me that the work that we're doing in addressing uh, nicotine dependence with health disparity populations, but, but with behavioral health specifically, it's working. And I, I say that because the, the data supports it. When we're working with states, um, I'll take, since I'm in uh, Colorado, I'm gonna take Colorado, for instance. I know that uh, we see the, the prevalence rates among individuals with uh, mental illnesses and addictions, um, prevalence rates of tobacco use declining when we're not seeing that in uh, a lot of other health disparity populations. And we're seeing this nationally, starting to see this nationally as well. And I think that really speaks to uh, the work that we've been putting into this. Um, and, you know, and we lose track of that day to day, but, but we are, I think we are moving the needle. Of course, there's lots of other things going on out there. Um, so you can't, you know, you can't say that everything is causation, but in my mind, compared to other health disparity populations and the changes we're seeing, I think that, you know, that the, uh, the programming, the policy work that we're doing is working. And so what, uh, what I want to do is kind of set the stage a little bit, and I know that you've been doing this today as well, but talk about a little more about what um, I see on the horizon, what I, some of the, the present activities going on, and where I really uh, see that going uh, in, the, in the future as well. And when I say future, you know, the next, uh, next few years. Um, and then hopefully we'll have time to, to chat a little if you have questions, or I'd love to just hear from you about uh, what your responses are to, to impart to what I'm saying. You know, so the good news, uh, good news and bad news here, right? We, we have a lot of people that have behavioral health disorders in the United States. So any given time, again, we have one in four or one in five Americans has a diagnosable um, mental health issue or behavioral health, excuse me. So you, they either have a uh, mental illness or they have a substance use disorder. Um, why I put this up here, though, is what a big sea change that happened that is so critical is the fact that when we're looking at that overlap between uh, substance use disorder and uh, other mental illness, serious mental illness or any mental illness in this case, um, that now includes uh, tobacco use disorder. So, uh, you know, when I started this work, that wasn't the case, right? I mean, when we were doing the the national surveys uh, on drug use and health, 
um, that didn't include tobacco. Now it does. And uh, that's because of the changes with the DSM Diagnostic and Statistical Manual in 2013, I think in April of 2013, where now it's included, where it should have always been included as an addiction. Um, and so that's included in this now, but it's, you know, so that's a good case in many ways that we're starting to look at this, but 2013 was quite a long time ago. And we're still trying to, uh, a lot of the folks that I work with, and I think the folks that you work with, still don't necessarily put uh, nicotine uh, use or in the tobacco use disorder. I think it's a misnomer now. We should really call it nicotine use disorder. Um, they don't really put that still in the same category as these other uh, disorders. So we do have a, a lot of work to do in that regard. In, uh, so it's interesting that you know, when we talk about that word hidden, hidden epidemic, um, I do continue to hear the same myths over and over again about the fact that, you know, individuals need these, uh, need nicotine to uh, help with their symptoms of mental illness, um, that they can't quit, that they don't want to quit, you know, I can go uh, on and on. But the positive side of that is that there's a lot of people that also know that those are myths. And we have a lot more folks out there like yourselves that are speaking to those myths. So, and at least we're having that discussion more often than we did in, in the past. When I started uh, working uh, on this on these issues, it was hard to even get in to talk to a psychiatrist about this or a medical director in a clinic because the feeling was so strong that um, nicotine was helping with symptoms, particularly with schizophrenia that I was working a lot with at that case that they didn't even want to have the discussion. And so that's totally changed at a federal level, uh, you know, a national level, a state level, a community level. We are having those discussions and we're being supported by the, you know, the federal agencies like SAMHSA in this work uh, very heavily. I think some of you, maybe you've seen this Today, I don't know if you brought this up or not. Um, uh, Dr. Coley saying, no, you haven't seen this today, but uh, good. So, you know, I, I put this, uh, I use this slide quite a bit in, in, in the work that I do. Um, so you might've seen it if you've seen me talk before, uh, but, you know, basically this is saying, there's, there's two points to this slide. One is, is that, uh, we have made such amazing gains in tackling uh, tobacco use in the general population. So that's you're seeing that trend line in, in the middle from the mid 1950s in, in, until you know a few years ago, and you're seeing just how uh, amazing uh, you know we've gone from about you know 40 percent average down to you know a little over 13 percent now in the in the general uh, population. And that is just incredible. And what you're seeing on the top and the bottom is the, you know, the dots are the men, bottom is the women. And you're seeing different studies across the way about prevalence rates. And you're seeing how, you know, unfortunately men and women have come back, have come together pretty much as far as their prevalence rate, where, you know, in the 1950s, 1960s, men smoked at a much higher rate. But the other part of this is that we have not seen those successes uh, largely with the behavioral health population. Uh, even though I'm, I, I've told you we're starting to we're move the needle, um, of course the prevalence rate is still much, much higher among the uh, behavioral health population. And so you're seeing for, for specific uh, diagnoses on, on this uh, chart, um, what those prevalence rates are and you're seeing ranges because those are ranges across different studies but one of the points i want to make is that if you look at something like let's just look at you know something like major uh, depression and that is that line in the middle and a uh, dotted line coming down to about 1975 what that's telling you if we took a really conservative estimate amongst those studies that's telling you that people with major depression are still smoking at the same rate that the general population was smoking at in 1975. Okay, so we got we have a lot of work to do. If you look at schizophrenia, and you look at a really conservative number, and you look at 
let's just hit super conservative number. Let's take 50%, even lower than what's up there. That is telling you that the smoking rate is still among those individuals as high as you know the general smoking rate at its at its highest rate in the United States. So we we have a lot of work to do. At the same time that we're seeing gains, um, so there are there's positives and there and, and there's negatives going on. But the other thing that you know, so moving from that, uh, then again, is kind of where are we headed? What can we do with this? What have we done? And um, you know, again, obviously, uh, tobacco use is so incredibly addictive. In, in my mind, it, it's the most addictive substance out there. Having worked in many inpatient, outpatient settings, working with you know people that her had heroin addiction, cocaine addiction, etc., I will tell you, I think 100% of the time, if I asked them if they were smokers, what the har hardest drug to give up it would always be their smoking, um, their cigarettes. And, uh, and so, you know, and it's just uh, smoking itself is, is just the best example of, of if we looked at the addiction cycle of, of what we're seeing, you know, as far as tolerance, uh, withdrawal symptoms and cravings. And so, you know, what I've been doing a lot of work in and a lot of my colleagues uh, nationally have been looking at is the fact that it really doesn't make sense to put tobacco in a silo. And there's many silos that we can put tobacco in and say, well, we've got to treat tobacco over here and other addictions over here. Well, you know, if we're not treating uh, these addictions concurrently um, or have them in the same treatment plan, we're really missing the boat. Uh, because if we're not including nicotine, the, you know, as that most addictive substance out there, in addition to cannabis use or opioid use or amphetamine use, then we're going to have a really hard time helping people with those other addictions. And they're going to be much more uh, liable to relapse. And that's what the, the evidence shows us as, as well. And so um, it and when I say concurrent use, I, I want to be really clear about that because a lot of times people have confusion about what I mean. And, and they say, well, you can't treat both of these things at the same time. Well, I mean, you can, but it's really uh, meeting people and clients and patients where they're at and saying that, you know, it's really critical to have your tobacco use as part of your treatment plan. That doesn't mean we have to do it the same day. Um, that, but it does mean that we have to uh, address it if you really want to be most uh, effective in getting past your, uh, your dependency. Um, and so, and there's a wide variety of ways to do that. But this really, of course, comes into play with the vaping products as well. And that's a lot of the, the where I see things going, though, is are these co-treatment models. Um, and that, you know, largely is because we know that at base, the you know, the biopsychosocial factors that lead to addiction are the same. It doesn't matter what addiction it is. And so we need to work on all those things uh, together. And, um, you know, with the behavioral health population specifically, uh, some of these are really, really important, like uh, stigma, implicit bias, uh, trauma. You know, you all are probably aware of how many of the individuals that we serve have a trauma history, but it's, you know, it's the majority. And so whether it's, if we're looking at ACE scores and we're looking at, it doesn't really matter the type of trauma, but it, it's there. And, and so we have to have trauma informed care. We have to go back to that word recovery. Recovery means having a, you know, a meaningful life and, and yeah, the pandemic is really impinged on that. Uh, but, you know, boredom, isolation, lack of work, um, th those lead to addiction. And so that's the, really some kind of, uh, some of the factors that, uh, you know, I, I see that we need more work on uh, because we're all apt to, as human beings, if we don't have, you know, relationships, we don't have meaningful work, you know, Freud got those two things right. And, and if we're bored, we're going to eat uh, bad food, watch bad TV, and we're going to get addicted to things, right? And, and so we've, we've got a lot of work to do in, in that regard as well. So we tend to focus a lot on biology. And, the, and this is just saying that biology is important, 
but um, all these other things, it's the same across addictions. We don't need to put tobacco in a silo. So a lot of the programming we're doing when I've done analysis about what the overlap is between, say, a psychosocial group that I'm doing for tobacco versus something I'm doing for uh, opioid addiction, the overlap is about 90%. And it's just adding those kind of extra kind of tweaks uh, to it to make sure that tobacco is involved in it. And we're not um, leading people into you know, more addiction, incarceration, res recidivism, relapse, and poor health. So that's why the Surgeon General, uh, you know, this, there's of course been many, many Surgeon General reports on tobacco. This one was on addiction in 2017. And I'm going to use it, but I'm going to use it even though in this report, and we're talking about 2017, uh, tobacco was never mentioned in this. So it was, it was saying, the Surgeon General was saying, um, you know, we co-treatment is the only adequate solution to addiction. So the Surgeon General was making the same point, saying that if we're going to treat one addiction, we have to treat all addictions or we're not going to be as effective as we can be. Um, but he left out tobacco and, and, and nicotine. And so that just shows you that even back in not too long ago in 2017, we still had a little room for improvement. And so I added it in. <laughs> so, and, 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 and saying that it applies equally to tobacco and nicotine as well. And I think the Surgeon General now would uh, completely be on board with that. Um, and if we're doing this work, we know uh, how effective it is with uh, mental, mental health uh, issues and addiction. You know, I mentioned the fact that if we treat concurrently, and this is going back to our colleague Jody Prochaska's work as far back as 2004, that if we treat cocaine or alcohol together with, uh, with tobacco, we're going to have a 25% better outcome for the main reason someone came into treatment for that primary drug that wasn't tobacco that someone came into treatment for. But on top of that, you know, there was always that notion of that myth that if people could smoke and their depression, their anxiety, their mental health symptoms were going to get worse, they might get psychotic, etc. But we know that, you know, over and over again, we just know that's just uh, not the case. Uh, the evidence just does not bear that out anymore. We know that actually um, if people continue to smoke, they actually, their depression and their anxiety increases and their stress increases. If they quit smoking, their depression goes down, their anxiety goes down, their stress goes down, positive mood goes up, quality of life goes up. And what's really, um, what really stood out for me for this, uh, for this study uh, these last two points, which, which were from the Taylor uh, meta-analysis that he did, is, is that, um, you know, really we're seeing the same case whether with those with psychiatric disorders and those without psychiatric disorders. But the, the, the big thing that hit me is that they're saying quitting smoking um, can be as effective as uh, tre treating uh, depression and anxiety with uh, you know, anxiolytics or antidepressant medications. That's a big statement saying that we can just by helping people quit smoking, they might not even need those medications. Um, so, and I'm not anti-medication by any means. I think it's a, a very important tool in, in our armament, armament um, that we should be using and particularly using for uh, smoking cessation, you know, as medication assisted treatment, but uh, these were just really kind of eye-opening results. And it seems like every year another study comes out that shows the same thing. So we just need to be be able to kind of combat that notion that um, I'm doing this for my stress, I'm doing this to relieve depression, anxiety, um, and really talk to people about what that means from a motivational intervention perspective. Um, and really make sure that people are using the standard of care. And when I say people, I mean providers. <laughs> so, you know, all of the interdisciplinary providers out there. Uh, because right now we know um, that the evidence-based practices that we have, both on the medication side and on the, you know, on the psychological uh, side, um, are some of the most effective treatments out there for addictions. They probably are the most effective uh, interventions out there for 
addictions. And if you hold them up against other kind of clinical interventions, be it some like statins or something like that, they blow that those kinds of interventions out of the water. We know this. There's just no um, argument anymore that we have a standard of, a, of care for tobacco cessation generally, and we much uh, and to be much more specific. We know that that standard of care applies equally to the behavioral health population, that the behavioral health population benefits by exactly the same standard of care as the general population, yet we can tailor it to make it even more effective sometimes. So I'm getting a lot more vocal these days about the fact that not only is this the standard of care, but if uh, practitioners aren't using the standard of care, then it's malpractice. You know, it's there's an ethical issue here and it becomes malpractice. And, I, you know, it's only been recently when I've been using that strong a language just because the evidence is so um, overpowering in that regard. And if you look at what, well, what does malpractice mean? It means that, uh, you know, someone's not using the standard of care uh, consistently and it's leading to harm or damage. And I think there's a really easy case to make in that regard. So that's the legalese, the legal version of what uh, malpractice is, that it's leading to damage either from a healthcare perspective or it's leading to damage uh, from a monetary perspective so someone can't work. Um, and that's an easy case to make. Um, so, you know, I, I think in some ways uh, we can start kind of uh, using um, the ethics around this a lot more powerfully. And so I see that happening much more in the future. And at the same time, what we're doing is saying, hey, you, we have the standard of care. We, we know what works out there, but we can tailor the treatment. We don't always have to tailor the treatment to every health disparity population. I think there's a tendency to say that we need to tinker with what we know works for every kind of unique population. And that's really, I don't think that's the case all the time, but I do think it's the case. Um, and I think we have good evidence for it's the case with the behavioral health population. And so we can do that in a variety of different ways. One is just, you know, a lot of the individuals that do, do this work feel like they can't do it because they say um, they don't have the training. And the training is really, you know, it's not hard, it's not, e you know, it's fairly easy, uh, but we need to provide it. And so those that are doing any kind of addiction treatment or any kind of uh, psychological behavior change, they are the best position to do this work. They can do this work. They can do it incredibly well. They just need support and to feel that they're competent in that. And it takes very little time to do that. And so um, that's a lot of the work we do is just making sure people are up to speed on the fact that you know, what they're doing with the other addictions and a lot of other mental illnesses um, works for, for tobacco work and nicotine uh, work as well. Uh, and so that is some things like cognitive behavioral therapy and how can we tweak, tweak that a little and motivational enhancements to speak to tobacco. But at the same time, we also know that um, due to some cognitive issues that some individuals face uh, with behavioral health conditions. And, you know, I, that's often overblown. I'm going to say that because I, you know, I used to work, we often say that, you know, individuals with schizophrenia can't benefit by something like quitline services because they, you know, cognitively, they, 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 uh, it's just not appropriate. Well, um, we've shown that that's not the case. And, uh, you know, having done a lot of work with indiv individuals with schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder, um, they actually cognitively are much more, uh, uh, you know, together on average than when I used to do work with ca cancer uh, patients and the cognitive conditions, that, you know, cognitive changes they were going through. And we really never questioned that with, with those patients. So I think it's interesting, the stigma that we have to fight with, with some of these populations. But at the same time, you know, we do know there's psychiatric rehabilitation strategies we can use, like chunking things, making sessions uh, shorter, uh, more frequency of sessions. Um, so it's those types of things that really might uh, be a way we can uh, tinker with uh, different uh, modalities like, say, quitline services to make them even better for this population. And to, you know, intertwine that with whatever other cultural elements are going on, uh, because basically, you know, the 
behavioral health issues are cross cutting across all these other health disparity issues that we're facing um, and that put people at multiplicative risk for unnecessary death and disease. And we just need to make sure that we're being a, as culturally uh, competent and appropriate as, as we can be. But at basis, you know, you, you probably have heard a lot about the five A's and that's really kind of the foundation we go back to is, is you know, it's, the, it's mindfulness, it's uh, motivational work and it's the five A's to really engage folks, meet people where they're at and uh, make sure that we're using this very simple, you know, uh, the simple model, simple yet not very well used right now. You, a lot of people ask and advise and there's some assess, but the system and arrange part is still, we've got a long ways to go in that re regard in our healthcare system. Um, even if it's very simple referral as assisting people, it's just not happening as much as we would see. And then really moving people into what we know through the Preventive Services Task Force, again, what works with, um, you know, the general population works with the behavioral health population. So, telephonic counseling, digital support, group support, individual. We spent a lot of, of time in, on, in our shop focusing on peer work. I'm gonna come back to that in a second because I think that's so powerful, but really at the end of the day, making sure we're speaking to medication assisted treatment. And uh, one of the things that I've seen at, that's really gotten in the way of and put tobacco in a silo is the jargon of uh, public health. And well, it's just the jargon that you know public health versus the the other uh, healthcare communities. So not that one is worse or better, but we're missing each other. So when we talk about cessation uh, work, well, there's no other. You know, when I was doing addiction work or in the healthcare arena, no one uses that word uh, cessation. It's it's very unique uh, to tobacco and it's jargony. So we really need to speak the language of the, you know, organizations we're working with. And uh, when we're doing uh, providing FDA approved medications for uh, nicotine uh, use and we're providing uh, psychological interventions, we are doing that. And we're doing that really effectively. And so we really need to refer to it as such um, and make sure that we're kind of boundary spanners in the work we're doing and uh, kind of breaking down that communication barrier. So that, you know, that again, that's been going on, but I see that as work that we need to continue, um, particularly as I'm, I, I have a slide in a minute, just talking about the overlap between public health and specialty care and, uh, and addictions type of work and, and kind of, again, how we miss the, the boat when we're speaking to that. But I also mentioned that I think we're going to get better about making sure that our work is trauma informed. And um, this is very much in the mix uh, in, in the behavioral health world, but it's, it's fairly new in the public health world um, to, to speak about trauma informed care. Uh, but number, you know, the number one thing that comes up in the work when I'm talking to people, it's trust. Um, and so if I could boil down um, a lot of what we need to do um, into, you know, one, you know, two words, it's, it's building trust. Um, and so, and that's a, a, you know, a core part of trauma informed care and having that, you know, collaborative approach to, to care planning, again, meeting people where they're at and the readiness for change saying this is a really important issue. If you had asthma or diabetes, I wouldn't be saying, oh, do you want to put this in your treatment plan? It's part of your treatment plan, but it's just at the same time, um, you might not want to do anything with it right now. Um, that's fine, but it's still part of your treatment plan and empowering people to figure out where they want to go uh, on their journey and where what wellness store they want to open first. And if that includes tobacco initially, or it might include something else. Um, but, you know, just part of that we find is that so has been so powerful is the peer programming that we do. So we've trained, uh, I don't know, something like 6,000, 7,000 uh, peer specialists. So these are individuals with lived experience of having a, a mental illness and addiction, or we do a lot of work in criminal justice or homelessness arenas or the sectors. And so these are individuals with a lived experience of being incarcerated or um, being homeless. 
And so these are amazing augments, you know, the, the services that these individuals can provide augment other the existing care teams so dramatically in my mind, because they're able to build that trust that I was talking about and really engage folks and speak their language and get past that uh, jargon um, that people are experiencing. And so, you know, I, I see a lot more uh, really innovative ways that we're using peers. And I think that that's going to uh, continue uh, in the future and see that coming a lot more. And, and part of what I see, which has been really a limiting factor. So I'm just putting this up as one example in Colorado, but, you know, we have to be paid for our work. And so peers uh, historically has been a real barrier to being able to bill for services in, uh, including addiction uh, types of services. And that is changing. So even within Colorado um, in 21, uh, 2021, they uh, passed a law where now uh, peer-led peer -led, uh, agencies can now bill independently for their services, so they don't have to be bill under a healthcare team or incident to uh, services. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is that uh, that institutional support I was talking about. That there's really been this groundswell uh, and this grassroots movement around the need to address uh, tobacco cessation in, in the peer world, but we need those um, infrastructure supports. And so billing is, 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 is a key to that work. And so um, we've been working with a lot of states on, the, on this issue, and I think uh, a lot more of this is gonna happen as well. And then with the, you know, again, an institutional type of uh, structural support we need is the policy. And so uh, you, you notice now that I'm using nicotine free policy. We've done a lot of, you know, in the past tobacco free campus policies, and we've had the privilege of bringing about 500 agencies, behavioral health agencies, tobacco free. Uh, but I really encourage people to really look at this as nicotine free policies now and to make sure that you're weaving all non FDA uh, approved products into this. So the vaping products and anything new that's going to emerge, which there will be, you know, the, the industry is creative and there'll be new things that pop up every year. Um, but establishing those nicotine free policies is a really necessary support. Uh, and we know that, uh, you know, if you use uh, the steps out there that, you know, we, we have a toolkit with 10 steps. And if you follow those steps, um, you can uh, implement a, a campus policy pretty painlessly. And it's not to say that there's not going to be issues that emerge in enforcement and so forth, but there's, uh, you know, we know a lot of what works in that regard too. And so I see a lot more, even though we've been doing this a long time, there's going to be a lot more work to just uh, reimagining or revisioning what the what your tobacco-free policy should look like and making sure that you're making it as strong as possible. So the other thing that Emily, you know, actually uh, brought brought this up, but one of the things that um, has been really successful is uh, building communities that are really reflecting on the changes that they can make um, realistically um, and how they can tailor to their unique organizations and really rethink and revise. And so we've been uh, developing these community of practice models um, for quite some time since, you know, really going back to about 2013. But, you know, the, and it was loosely built on the ecosystems that um, I'm sure some of you have heard of. Uh, but it's this notion that if we take an evidence-based, um, take champions and then we train them in the evidence base, but also give them a chance to really, as peers, have a peer-to-peer -peer network and talk about, you know, what are changes that we can make? What are rapid improvement um, projects that we can take on that are realistic, that are actionable? And what might some of those barriers be? And have that peer-to-peer -peer dialogue um, and, and share what's working, what's not working, how, we, how can we overcome those hurdles uh, together. And this has been really just incredibly uh, productive. And we've done these communities of practice for at a state level. So states come together, we do this through the um, National Behavioral Health Network, our CDC network that we help administer for tobacco and cancer control. But we've seen it at um, 
you know, individual state level, bringing together a lot of partners, looking at what are our rapid improvement goals, um, what is that plan do study act cycle that we can engage in over about six months, and how can we come back and look at what's worked, what hasn't worked, and spin that cycle again. And then we're also doing it, you know, you can do it at a, a you know, just an individual hospital or organizational level as well. And so we're just continuing to get better at this. You know, the more you do this, the better you get at it. And we're looking forward to kicking off uh, quite a few of these in the coming year. And when we're doing that work, we're really taking, this is where I see a lot of, uh, of uh, our work going is what we call a person-centered health neighborhood. And so, you know, when I started this work in, with uh, primary care, clinics, you know, we were talking a lot about patient centered uh, medical homes, which is a really important model, you know, it's a way of collaborating care and making sure that if someone's coming into a PCP, that um, they're getting all the services they need. But the, the issue that I always had with that is that you actually have to uh, have access to or show up to a, a primary care clinic for that to work. And so it's really taking a much more broad approach to that model that we're now calling the person-centered health neighborhood approach and saying we we need to meet people where they're at, not only in their readiness for change, but where they're actually seeking services and not wait for them to be navigated to a specific site, be it hospital or primary care site, for instance. And so we're going out and we're working with a variety of partners and saying, this is where people are already showing up. Let's, let's you know address their needs, their imminent needs, and let's try to weave whole health into that and as part of whole health, let's make sure that tobacco is a piece of that conversation. And again, a lot of people might not be ready for that um, and that's fine, but it's creating a partnership with these individuals, a lot of times with peers taking the lead where we create those lasting uh, relationships where eventually we get to tobacco. And uh, you know, I'll provide a few examples of that in a, a minute. But the other thing that, you know, really seems to be happening right now um, across the states that we work in is, is that there's just this increasing overlap between uh, i apologize dr morris but we i can't hear you i don't know if i'm the only one. Oh, okay is that the case for others as well i can hear him oh, okay i'm sorry if some of you can't hear me are there any others that can't oh, any, yeah is there anyone else Heather, it's maybe on, something on your end. It's on my end. It just told me I had an unstable network. I'm so sorry. Okay. No, that's I okay. just wanted to catch it if it was everybody. I'll just stop my video. Heather, usually I'm the unstable one. So I'm glad that you're, I'm glad you're playing that role today. <laughs> but yeah, you, you know, the other thing that I'm seeing a lot of is this, this uh, overlap between public health, uh, behavioral health, and primary care. What I mean by that is that um, increasingly, what I'm seeing is that public health, which, you, you know, used to be population focused, is getting much more involved in, in care, in clinical care. And at the same time, I'm seeing primary care and specialty care and behavioral health get much more involved in population health. Um, so it's really interesting how these rules are kind of colliding right now. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity there, but I think what, you know, what our task is going to be doing this work in the next few years is trying to make sure that our services aren't redundant, make sure that we're coordinating what we're doing and we're really um, playing off of each other's strengths. Um, and so that's a lot of the conversations that, uh, you know, I personally am having with my own um, public health department, state public health department, uh, but I'm, I'm seeing this kind of emerge over and over again, because a lot of times, you know, where uh, systems are moving to our accountable care organizations, for instance, or we call those, uh, you know, we have our own jargon, we call them regional accountable ent entities in Colorado. But again, their, their um, mandate for Medicaid and so forth is to work at a population level too. So there's a lot of opportunity there, but there's also I'm seeing a lot of confusion there. So I just uh, bring that up because I think that we're going to see a lot more of that work and we're going to have a role in that work um, right now and in the coming future. But going back, you know, again, what we've been trying to do with that health care neighborhood is really identify who are the local champions and, and they're often not the usual suspects. 
out there that really, for whatever reason, um, uh, you know, have a really are passionate about this and uh, want to play a role in communities. And we do a lot of work in rural America, in our rural areas. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, if I could, this is one of my dreams I'm going to share with you. If I could make a hybrid tobacco or nicotine, um, you know, nicotine use disorder person and mix that with a large animal vet, I'd be very happy because they could go out and they could do all those things at the same time, address mental health crisis, what the animals are going through and weave nicotine into it. And I bring that because we got to get creative with this. So I'm, I'm being a little facetious, but at the same time, I'm not because actually some of the large uh, ranches, for instance, are one of the partners that we work with in addressing policy, nicotine policy and weaving, you know, cessation services or, uh, you know, dependent services in, into that, into what we're doing. So, you know, it's going to be fun to really meet people where they're at and get creative about that. And two of the um, programs that we've done recently that have been really, um, I feel like really innovative uh, and have been really, you know, we've seen the impact. So we've done some some good evaluations of, of these and you can uh, read about those on our website um, where we have these playbooks. But in one, what we did is we took peer specialists and in taking that healthcare neighborhood approach, we train peers, they were supervised by social workers, but we trained them when we placed them in the Denver Public Library, because we knew that's where the, the, the homeless, people that were homeless, at risk for homelessness, poverty, that's where they were showing up. So we wanted to meet people where they were at. And so we had peers there to uh, do a few things. And we knew it couldn't, we couldn't put nicotine in a silo or tobacco use in a silo. That wasn't their imminent issue. So we had them talk about, you know, their, where were they sleeping that night? You know, what did they need to get by? We, we did, we trained uh, folks to do, navigate to uh, needed healthcare services. And then we also, brought into that mix addiction, you know, and tobacco. And we're talking about an environment where uh, we train our, 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 we had to train our peers to use Narcan because uh, I'll tell you what, we would have our meetings, um, our, our project meetings down at the library. Every meeting I was at, there was an overdose in the library on opioids. And so uh, we, you know, so we had to meet people where they're at, cross train and slowly weave nicotine into the discussion. And the other um, project here, what we did is we trained peers to uh, become part of treatment teams in homeless shelters and integrated care. Um, those were the two main ones. So it was mostly homelessness types of environments. And we, what we had peers do, we didn't want them to work beyond their scope of practice, but we had them do just a really simple uh, chronic illness screen with folks so that we could help get them uh, and then again, navigate them to services they need. And a lot of, cor of course, the chronic care symptoms they were uh, exhibiting were, were due to their smoking. And so really weaving that in. And when I say navigate to care, um, the power of peers in part is the fact that we're not just talking about this stuff. I mean, the peers were actually walking people to the clinics. This wasn't, uh, you know, handing someone a card or even a warm handoff. Um, I mean, I guess it's the warmest handoff because, you know, you're walking people to the door, you're walking to the clinic. Um, so that's kind of where we're trying to close uh, some of the gaps. And another few quick examples I want to share with you. One is we've been working a lot in criminal justice, in the criminal justice system. And so they use something called the sequential intercept model. So that's their jargon in uh, the criminal justice system saying, well, where are you gonna intervene? What intercept, right? When the police show up, or are you gonna intervene at a, a specialty court? And so um, we use this model because it's their jargon. And so, well, where are you gonna intervene with tobacco? Right. So where do you have the chance to interview with tobacco? A lot of times it's in uh, community corrections, the work we do, or it's as people are. So it's that intercept five in this case. So as people are reentering their communities, um, we can train them um, 
to look at tobacco use as part of addictions and, and health care and then provide those services, often peer driven and peer led when they're in the community and they're doing the community integration. Or we can, you know, another one is we work a lot with specialty courts and the judges so they understand they can actually they can actually mix in. Um, if they know someone's a tobacco user, they will mix that into the addiction treatment recommendations and mandates that the court's making. Um, so those are two examples on that level. Um, but, you know, what this slide is, is showing you is just the fact that one of the uh, programs I'm most proud of right now is that we went in, we work across the criminal justice system in Arizona, and we actually went into the departments of corrections in uh, when we train uh, inmates in how to run our dimensions program, which is our tobacco cessation group curricula. And, um, and uh, they did a spectacular job. I mean, they really got, um, you know, there was no, uh, people didn't have to go to this. The inmates did not have to attend these sessions by any means. And they were able to engage their, their peers, those other incarcerated folks into this program. So they were not only learning a marketable skill, so then when they got out, they could actually do this type of work. When they got out, um, they were helping with their own addiction. We know that if you help treat others, you're more liable to stay abstinent yourself, but then they're also helping um, their, their peers uh, learn about this and help them plan for um, you know, the stressors they're gonna face to uh, reuse when they, when they get out. And so, that's one example of that. And so we've taken that that intercept model from criminal justice and we said, well, what's the behavioral health equivalent of that? So that's kind of where we're at right now is saying, okay, let's create the same thing for behavioral health. We have all these intercepts. What are the behavioral health intercepts? So that's what you're seeing in this is you're seeing there are different places we can intervene. These are overlapping, but then we can work with each community each you know organization and say where is your pressure point where is your strength where are your assets where can you realistically intervene create a rapid improvement project over the next six months and we're going to help set you up for success and so this is kind of a mapping that we now use and and so this is kind of where uh, we're going as a team uh, right now and and we'll be using this with our our next uh, cycles of grants that we're getting and then we're weaving that into whole health. You know, again, I find it really just so important. Um, my experience has been that if we are able to weave tobacco into whole health, um, and uh, it's just, we get much more engagement. And, and so we can go in and say, we're gonna open multiple doors to wellness. We're gonna, we're gonna talk to you about your healthy eating and your physical activity and your stress and your sleep. And uh, we're going to, you know, also offer the, you know, addiction and tobacco services, but you start where you want to start. Okay. Because we know that as you build self efficacy around any uh, health uh, area that you choose, you are going to uh, naturally become a different person. And um, you're either going to start looking at your addictions or in some cases people just quit smoking or they reduce their smoking, we're not even talking about it. So it's really just uh, taking that whole health approach and doing that in a parallel process. And what I mean by that is it's so critical that we attend to staff and employees wellness needs at the same time we're um, doing that for those that we serve, particularly, you know, with the, I mean, all the stressors were already there, burnout, burnout was already there. Uh, but the pandemic, of course, exacerbated that, but it was something we were already dealing with. And we have to take care of our own and so that they can take care of others. And so uh, with this whole health uh, type of perspective, this health neighborhood perspective, the work we do, we're always trying to take this parallel process about what are you doing for staff and employees, as well as what are you doing for your those that you're serving as well, and then branding that making sure that we're saying, you know, we're interested in all these dimensions of wellness and, um, you know, both for clients and employees. And, you know, in a, uh, if we're going to retain staff um, in a very competitive market, we've got to do this. I mean, it's um, inherent <laughs> to our, our wellness and, and, you know, the community's wellness overall. So that's me. That's what I want to share with you. I, I know that we're 
fairly close to then, but I'd love to hear if you have any, um, you know, comments or anything else you'd like to offer. And if there are, maybe Emily, you can help me if there's anything coming up. Yes, absolutely. So you all feel free to drop any comments or questions in the chat or um, also feel free to unmute and ask Dr. Morris your questions. We'd love to hear from you. We have a few minutes here, so. I know one of the things that I wanted to mention was I just absolutely love the discussion of the peer, the importance of the peer support and the peer support specialists. Um, with the uh, support of the state, we've been able to offer scholarships for the tobacco treatment specialist program. And to date, we have had 32 that have finished. So these are for people working in behavioral health organizations. And over the summer, we had our first scholarship recipient who was a peer support specialist. So That's we're nice. just super excited about that. And just that was really validating to hear. And, all right, let's see, we've got some comments. Um, Gary says, thank you, Dr. Morris. The arc for change has been long, but now heading in the right direction. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Dr. Morris, this is Stephanie Keeler. I just have a question about um, um, like teens and the increase that we're seeing in, you know, depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Do you know if they're being assessed early on, like, because they, they are hearing to, you know, that, that vaping is helps relax and things like that. Is there a target toward that population? I guess, you know, I, one thing I will tell you is that I think that this is a, I didn't talk, speak to it I, and maybe I should have, uh, cause it's so critical is that I don't think there's uh, nearly enough attention paid to teens that already have behavioral health issues and their, uh, tobacco and be, you know, and nicotine use, um, we're, you know, there's just that, programming specifically, there's a huge gap and, and we need to fill that. And so one way um, that I've seen some folks, some teams, some states trying to fill that is really working with the, with the, the uh, health, uh, or I'm sorry, the school system health clinics, because historically they haven't tackled this either. And so, and they weren't tackling cannabis. Um, so it's really uh, trying to Put that message across and, and it's getting out there but um, really uh, and that's that overlap if you're going to talk about cannabis talk about vaping and talk about um, you know nicotine use and vice versa and so uh, that's where I, I see a lot of this um, going I hope it's just you know all the kids are using it it's all overlapping and so but we tend to kind of split it apart or sometimes not even cover it so I, I hope a whole lot more attention is paid to this me too. Thank you. All right. Any other comments or questions? All right. Well, we're right about at our time. So, um, Dr. Morris, we just want to thank you so much for being here with us today. It was just a wonderful presentation. And I, I know that I probably speak for everybody. It was very motivating and it feels, um, you know, really validating that the work we're doing is on the right track. And uh, we just appreciate you so much. So thank you. thank you. Well, thanks for all the work everyone's doing. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks.